welcome to episode 58 of Once Upon a Nightmare. As always, I'm your host Lorraine, and I'm here to discuss the fictional horrors of the world. Sometimes they may be real. But before I get into all that, I just thought I'd mention that at the weekend, I was at a event called For the Love of Horror that was in Manchester. And as you can imagine, it was like a, a comic con, but for horror people. And I had so much fun. I went with my friend Michaela. I got to meet uh, Skeet Yorick from Scream. I got to see Skeet Yorick and Matthew Lillard, who walked past me, uh, do a QA, and a which was amazing. And I'm probably going to do a Scream episode at some point, so I'll talk about that a little bit more then. I also got to have my picture taken with Richard Brake, sweetest guy, hugged me so hard. And, uh, you know, that's how I roll now, hang with the celebs. There was quite a few there. We had uh, Abraham from The Walking Dead. There was a lot of the Rocky Horror Picture Show there. But I also got to meet some fellow podcasters. I got to meet Phil and Laura from the Horror Project podcast. We had a few drinks and hang out uh, for a bit. Great couple. And I also got to meet, who has been on here quite a few times, Stuart from the British Murders podcast. He is so tall. I swear to God, my neck hurt. He wanted to try and get me to go into this horror maze and that I had actually thought about going into. But I didn't because they make you crawl. And he was like, come with me, I'll go with you. But in that kind of like, oh, come with me, I'll go with you and look after you. No, you wouldn't. You'd make it worse. I, I don't know him that well, but I know him well enough to know that he would have made it worse. But I have made an agreement that if we both go again next year, then I will go through it. So I've said that live now. So I think that's like a binding contract. So Stuart, I will go through the maze with you next year if we are both there. <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to this episode. And I'm taking it back to the 80s and 1985 to be exact. And this is Silver Bullet. It began in May. And every month after that, whenever the moon was full, it happened again. And again. What was that? It's over there. Who oh, that at me? Nobody knew who or what was responsible. Come on. They only knew it had to be stopped. Now, from the master of mystery and suspense, Stephen King's Silver Bullet. Silver Bullet was directed by Daniel Attias. This was the only movie that he would actually direct, but he did go on to have a really good career as a TV director. Did things like The Boys, which is amazing, Billions, Homeland, Ray Donovan. Honestly, he's done so much. Go check him out on IMDb. He's done loads. The screenplay was written by Stephen King, and that was based on the novella by himself called Cycle of the Werewolf. It had a budget of $7 million and grossed 12 point. Three million. It takes place in a small, quiet town, Tarker's Mill, and it's experiencing a series of unexplained murders. It stars Corey Haim as Marty, a young paraplegic boy who ends up coming face to face with a werewolf one night and realises that this has been the culprit all along committing the murders. Along with his uncle, Red, played by Gary Busey, and his sister Jane, played by Megan Follows, they decide to track down the werewolf, ending its reign of terror. Werewolf. Werewolf is a hard word to say fast. So I'm probably going to sound silly throughout this film, throughout this episode. <laughs> so this small town was filmed in actually a place called Burgau, which is North Carolina. And it seems to be a big spot for movies. There was quite a few films that were filmed there. Some you may have heard of. I know what you did last summer. The Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, The Devil's Hand, and some more. Now, despite this film starring 80s star Corey Haim, it doesn't really get as much recognition as other movies that have werewolves in them. 
you know, in the 80s, we had, but very early 80s, the Howlin, American Wolf in London. Then we had Teen Wolf a bit later on. And, you know, even when I did a bit of a Google search of 80s werewolf films, it didn't really show up on the first page. Lost Boys did, but I've seen that film so many times, but I don't remember any werewolves. I remember vampires? Were there werewolves? I can't remember them. This one didn't make the cut on that page. And, you know, it's a shame because it's actually not that bad. Granted, when they made this, like Corey Haim hadn't really kind of, you know, been shot into everyone's face at this stage because The Lost Boys was when everyone really got to know him, I feel like, more. And then he became part of the two Corys. But that was after this. But it wasn't that long after this. So you think people would have kind of went back to it, checked it out, and it would have been more well known. Haim was unfortunately one of those child actors who wasn't really looked after that well and his career did take a nosedive after the 80s he didn't really do much um after that and that happens to quite a lot of stars unfortunately and then he passed away at only 38 in 2010 so he was definitely one of the one of the child actors that was basically chewed up and spat out by Hollywood and I just never really hear anyone mention this film well apart from my uh, my friend, she's a fellow 80s fan. That's Ray from Not Before Coffee. And she's the only person that's ever mentioned this to me. So I thought that's why I do it for spooky season. It's got werewolves. It's spooky. So in folklore, a silver bullet is known to be one of the few weapons that can actually kill a werewolf. When thinking of the mythological animal, we tend to go by what we see in the movies. To become a werewolf, a person gets like bitten, scratched. Basically, I think the skin needs to be penetrated on a full moon and they will become a werewolf. A person becomes a werewolf on a full moon, and then they change back when the moon goes. Or werewolves were known to be a mutant combination of human and wolf. Either way, you're basically screwed if you come face to face with one. They have no control over what they're doing. They will attack. They're very vicious. And that is something that I have seen in most of the werewolf films I've watched. I don't think I've actually watched many I'd have to go back. I know I'm doing an episode on an American world from London with another podcast. But as for others, I'd have to go back. I know they had them in Twilight, but I think they were more like dogs. Were they? I don't remember. I, know, I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it, so I don't know. Anyway, there are a few suggestions of where the werewolf, though, did originate from. I suppose when things go back so far, I guess it's harder to get a clearer understanding of when something originated. And things do tend to lose their validity the more they're told, people like to add on their bits. A bit like today, really. Chinese whispers, anyone? Anyway, I'll give you the origin from Greek mythology. I do love all this god shit of how the gods were angered. Seems so far-fetched, doesn't it? So when did we lose the power to turn someone into a werewolf if they pissed us off? I'd love that. No, everyone would be werewolves. So according to the locker room gossip back in the day, Lycane, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, the son of Pelascus, was a bit of a dick to Zeus. We've all heard of him. Now, if you're going to piss off a god, best not to go for Zeus. He is one of the top players when it comes to gods. Now, granted, I'd be pissed off too. So rumour has it, Lycaon, Lycaon served Zeus some dinner and it contained the remains of a sacrificed boy. That's not cool. Not cool at all. So Zeus, and what I call a bit of an overreaction, turned Lycaon and his sons into wolves. Now, I get you can throw him in jail. Jail's back then, barbaric. But this way... He turns him into a wolf, but then this wolf goes roaming the countryside, killing more people. So I think it's a bit of a fa failure there on Zeus's side. So the werewolf in this film, which I'll kind of go into more in a bit as into who it is, is more what I expect when seeing a film about werewolves, how they move, how they look. That's kind of what is in my head when I watch this. The film kind of gets into the murders pretty much straight away. There is a reason for all these murders, which I will go into in a bit. It isn't simply a werewolf loose on the town killing people. So we've barely started here and a man working on the rail tracks is being watched by something. At this stage, obviously, we don't know what it is, but we're getting a lot of point of view shots from whatever this thing is. And we soon find out it's a wolf and that kind of explains its behaviour. Now, I know people when they're, you know, going to attack, they kind of, you know, suss out the environment to see what's going on. But the wolves tend to do that as well. Now, I know they sometimes hunt in packs, but they do tend to circle their prey, you know, find out the, weak, the weakness and then attack accordingly so they know how to do it. But this kill, it's so clean when it happens. When we think of werewolf attacks, we think of it being a lot more slicey-uppy, 
you could say. But here it's over so quickly. We don't see anything. We see a head flying through the air and the next day there's a head on the tracks. We do not see the werewolf apart from a claw. So we know that it's not human and we see a piece of the arm which is obviously covered in hair as it swoops down for that fatal blow taking the head clean off it's quick and it's a painless death and he never saw it coming he turns around and goes ah and that's it and of course they think it's an accident on the tracks which to be fair it was so clean cut and the man in question was referred to as someone who had a bit of a drink issue so that would make more sense that he was drunk fell on the tracks and there was an accident rather than him being attacked by a werewolf. But had they done an autopsy, it might have become clear that this was actually not the work of a train. When we get to meet the main character, which is Marty, not much is really going on with him. He's just a young boy hanging out with his friend Brady. He's a bit of a dick. And they're just lads basically acting the Egypt, but just having fun. He argues with his sister. He lives at home with his family. Not really much to report. But these murders, they kind of keep happening and they make no sense. Next victim is Stella and she is played by Wendy Walker. Now, when Stella is killed, she is really made to suffer. This kill is not as cut and dry as the first. This is a full-blown attack and this girl has already had a bad day. She's found out she's pregnant by a married man. He has no interest in supporting her. He actually even says to her, it's your oven, but it ain't my bun you got baking in there, huh? See ya. I mean, what an absolute prick. So she goes home, she's distraught, and she empties some pills out to either abort the baby or take her life. I think she tries to take her life. And, you know, all the men in this film do get a quicker death than hers. Like, why was hers more brutal and more visually brutal? We really see every scratch from those massive claws. It's smashed into her bedroom. It's broken into her house. She's not even outside. Her clothes are ripped. Her skin is torn apart. Her death felt more like some form of real punishment. And, you know, was getting pregnant in this Christian town such a sin that this was the only option to kill her, to save the baby's soul, which will make sense in a second. And this was the 70s and unwed mothers, you know, they weren't looked upon well. And plus, this is two deaths. It's her and her innocent unborn baby. If we go through the other deaths, they were not mauled so viciously. Yes, they felt it, but by no means it was the same. The third kill was some abusive father, Milt. He was slightly attacked by a werewolf because he fell through the floor and a piece of wood came up and stabbed him. That was pretty quick. And the rest were the same. They were kind of thrown about, clawed, hit, you know, with a bat, but none as brutal as Stella. There was another death that we do not see, and that was Brady. He was Marty's friend. Now, Brady, as mentioned, he's a dick because he likes to pull pranks and he did a really horrible one on Marty's sister, Jane. But he's a teenage boy and, you know, they can act like Egypt sometimes. We don't see the kill, but we know it's going to happen because Marty is leaving and he's acting really weird. He just keeps looking back at him after they're playing and he just spends a bit too long doing it. So it kind of made me think we're going to something's going to happen here and we do feel though the aftermath of his death and that's from his father her played by Ken Broadhurst now this guy you know apart from like the main characters he's really actually a good actor and he's the most believable out of this film for me you know you really feel his despair his devastation by what's happened to his son like you really feel his pain of course it wouldn't be right if this kind of behaviour did not create a mob, a group of vigilantes off to catch this killer, who at this stage, they believe it to be a man. The sheriff does try to talk sense, but it is Brady's dad who puts fuel to the fire to catch this man and bring justice to his son. I have to say, his speech is pretty convincing, and you can't blame him. And the sheriff changes his tune pretty quickly, allowing them all to go off. Well, to be honest with you, he wouldn't have been out to stop them. So they all go off in search of this killer. Now, the issue with the vigilante groups in horror films, well, in any film really, is they never really have any sort of plan, do they? They kind of go in, all guns blazing, like some sort of Western, and it's no different with this film. And as a result, most of them die. And I suppose in their defence, they did think they were going after some bloke and not a wolf that is super strong and can rip you to pieces. They might have thought different. No, they probably still would have went. Marty does, of course, have his suspicions at this stage that it might be an actual werewolf. He's kind of starting to think things. But of course, he tells his uncle and his uncle's like, no, you're being silly. But 
because he thinks this, what he, and I know the werewolf can break into your house, it kind of makes it a bit more baffling for me. He goes out at night and he, you know, he's setting these firework things off, but this night actually does blow this whole case wide open as, you know, he's about to be the werewolf's late night snack, but he manages to shoot him in the eye with a firework. And this means, because obviously they know werewolves turn back into people, they can go looking for someone with a dodgy eye. So Jane believes him and goes off looking for a man with a messed up eye. And this is where it gets interesting. Enter Reverend Lowe, played by Everett McGill. His character, he fills in the blanks. From when I first saw him, I knew I knew it was him. I knew he was a werewolf. But I didn't know if I'd remembered or it was because I just thought that. And, you know, people wouldn't tend to think that he was the obvious choice. I mean, the people actually within the movie because he's a man of God. Now, I saw this in the 80s, but I remember absolutely nothing of it. I didn't even remember that Marty was in a wheelchair. But this guy's really creepy and there's definitely something not right here. We do see him all through the film, but he's kind of just there, just enough, but not too much. But he doesn't really come into play so much until Marty starts poking about this priest, though, is a very, very strange character. Firstly, as said, he is a man of God. He's supposed to be doing things for the greater good, but he is far from it. He knows he's a werewolf, but he doesn't see anything wrong with it. He doesn't see it as a curse. He murders so many people and he has no intentions of stopping, but he believes that what's with him is a gift, a gift from God. He's doing the Lord's work. He's punishing people. The people he kills have done certain things but they're not so bad that they need to be punished. You know, some of them are dicks. But Stella's was so unfair. And, you know, the person who should have got bloody torn up was a piece of shit that ran off for her. You know, it takes two to get pregnant, two. But that's a whole different podcast. But the thing is, is was her death so brutal because of how pregnant women, especially unwed pregnant women, were looked at in the 70s? Because honestly, she gets such a raw deal compared to everyone else. It's absolutely ridiculous. But with regards to the werewolf, you know, it's not a bad setup, actually, when we see him. It's, it's pretty, he's pretty convincing. And this was in the 80s. And I think they did a really good job on how the werewolf looked. Yes, they had, you know, the chance to learn from other movies such as The Howling and the American Horror from London. But I did find this werewolf to be quite terrifying to look at. It was really vicious. It stood tall. It was strong. It had these massive claws, these really, really sharp teeth, you know, with a bit of saliva and piercing eyes. And it could take off a man's head like it was a samurai. And the special effects guy here was a guy called Carlo Ramboldi. And he did things like E.T. and Aliens. So we know this guy knows his shit. But for an 80 thing, actually, even today, if I saw this this piece now I would think I, I would still feel that it was pretty convincing you know it was a suit actually it was a one piece and it was apparently it was covered in real hair bare hair and was operated by a crew with all the mechanics that were involved in it and apparently 12 people had to do it and when we first see the werewolf as mentioned we only see a little bit but this wasn't actually the intention the intention was to show more but they actually hadn't finished it and they had to start filming so that's why that's why we only get to see a little bit. But Everett himself, he actually wore this suit. That was him in it. There was originally a dancer hired to wear it, but it didn't work. He obviously didn't move, right, which you think he would have because he was a dancer. So Everett actually dedicated himself that much to the role that he actually did play the beast and the man. He did, of course, have a stunt double because there was a lot of very physical parts in this. So he probably needed a, you know, he couldn't do all of them. But he definitely played, he, he dedicated himself to the role, let's just say that. And Everett wasn't the only one to transform into a werewolf. We do get to see nearly the whole town as werewolves. And this scene is where Lowe, I suppose you could say he gets a bit of a taste for his own medicine. But unfortunately, that comes in the form of a dream, not in real life. He's addressing the congregation at a funeral. They're, all the people are attending and they're looking at him like they want to kill him. And he has terror in his eyes at this stage because they're just staring like such evils towards him. And they then all start turning into werewolves as they go up to attack him and he wakes up panicking. Now, the werewolves here, they were a mixture, basically, because money was a bit tight, so they couldn't turn them all into one. The ones in the back were basically just makeup. 
And then we had others that were able to move like their eyes, their mouth, their forehead, forehead. And then there were others like make a noise. So there was like a combination. I think it was three different combinations of what they could do with them. But it was a really quick scene. There was like no lingering shots on anyone as we see them transform. But it's enough to kind of put the heebie-jeebies into low as he wakes up and like pool a sweat. But it's not enough for him to stop. So the issue now is that Lowe now knows that people are kind of onto him a bit because they've seen the eye and he knows that they know something, but he's not 100% sure and he needs to do damage control. And obviously this means killing more people. So the people he kills are classed as almost deserving in the eyes of you know the Lord and stuff due to their lifestyle. But Marty, when he finds out that Marty actually knows what's going on, Marty's an innocent child. He's not done anything, but Lowe will stop at nothing to protect his identity. And this shows that he actually believes he has this gift. He has a right to do whatever he needs. And that means killing people. And, you know, that makes him more dangerous than you can imagine. He must think of himself as some sort of like missionary killer. Like there's these serial killers called missionary killers who think they're rid in the world of those who, who they feel have sinned. So they'll get rid, they'll cleanse society for us bullshit. So Marty then is the one that, because he's so involved in this now and he knows that Lowe is on to him and he knows that Lowe is going to kill him. So he comes up with the idea of the whole silver bullet to get one to kill the werewolf. Now there are various stories of where a silver bullet first originated. Like why can't there just be one story for something on the internet? And that's that. We need to open a page calling, calling it this is the real story, the only story. You don't need to look any further because it's quite frustrating when you go looking for stuff and you keep seeing all these different things. But anyway, so the one I've found is it dates all the way back to the 1700s in France in a small town of Gévaudan. A silver bullet was used by, now this is a long ass name, Jean Charles Marc Anton Humezelet du Enneval <laughs> and his son. So they were had this silver bullet and it was to kill the beast of Gévaudan. He was a man-eating killer and the idea of a silver bullet has passed down through the years as a way to kill a werewolf. So here uh, Marty has the help of his sister and his uncle known as Red and Red is a bit of an interesting character actually. He's he's a mess but you can tell he genuinely cares about Marty and Jane it takes a while for him to believe them, but he does come around to Marty's way of thinking after Marty is nearly killed by Lowe. He tries to run him off the road because, as said, Marty is in a wheelchair and the paint of the car is on the wheelchair. So he does believe that Lowe is after him. And he even goes so far as to tell the sheriff what's going on. And the sheriff, he's not buying it, but he looks into it and, you know, he shouldn't off because he gets killed. When I say he came around to their way of thinking when Red did, it was more he knew something wasn't right, but he didn't a million years think it was a werewolf. Like, I like Red. You know, he's a bit of a tragic character. He hits the bottle a bit too hard. He appears a bit lost, a bit lonely. He doesn't really have any family. His, marriage, his marriages have failed. And all he really has is Marty and Jane and his sister. But it's just, you know, the relationship there is a bit, a bit strained. But he really has a soft spot for Marty. And if Marty, of course, thinks him as this like really cool uncle, but he's not really is he and he visits so much I suppose because he doesn't have anyone else and he's a lot of fun but he pays real attention to Marty now when Marty's in his wheelchair it's not just the regular wheelchair that we're used to seeing he has one of those but he's got kind of a modified one and it goes faster it's like um like bicycle the side of it it's 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 driven by like you know what you'd see on a motorbike or something and then uh, red builds him an even faster one now this actually saves his life because of how fast it is but there's no way you would a kid would be allowed to go around in something like this it's insane um but adults as well I suppose they can be guilty of dismissing kids on a regular basis especially when they're coming out with stuff like that but Red Red speaks to him sometimes almost like he's a peer sometimes rather than someone who's older he, he just takes a lot of time for him and they have a great relationship and while Red is troubled He's the only adult who will go out of his way like this for Marty and actually, you know, chase after this make-believe werewolf at this time that he thinks is going on. So a whole plan gets put into action and Red is going to go along with whatever Marty wants to try and capture Low. At this stage, he's still not believing it, but he's going along with what Marty wants. And he's at Marty's house and they then, Red then sees that 
there is a werewolf and it comes into the house and it goes for Red. But Red can take a bit more, obviously. But the attack does feel more personal from Low. Like, he doesn't really, he doesn't kill Red. He just throws him around a bit. And it's like he's taken his time for all the meddling in the affairs. And like, because with everyone else, it was, apart from Stella, it was kind of a bit more quick. But this, it's going on and on for quite a bit. But this would be his downfall. He should have just got it over and done with because it gives them time to get that silver bullet and actually shoot them. And, you know, that's what he does. So the film basically ends like that. I did enjoy this film. I'm definitely glad I watched it. And it had some great moments. But, you know, take it for what it is. Don't examine it too much. It doesn't make you work for anything, really. It's kind of predictable, but it's entertaining has a few scares. Corey Haim is adorable and a reminder of why he became this massive star in the 80s. It is an 18 and I think that was right for the time, but I think today a 15 would be okay. So go check it out and let me know what you think. And that is my little take on Silver Bullet and the end of Spooky Season. Go back and check out the other episodes I did for October or Spooktober as they like to call it. We've got Halloween 3, Nosferatu and Sleepy Hollow. And if there's anything you want me to cover, let me know and I will have a watch and give you a shout out. And I'd like to say thanks for listening. And don't forget to rate and review on iTunes for updates, reviews and behind the scenes. You can follow me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast, Twitter as A Nightmare Pod, Facebook as Once Upon a Nightmare. You can email me as Once Upon a Nightmare Pod at gmail.com. Nobody ever emails me. And I'm also on Buy Me A Coffee as A Nightmare Pod. And I am also on my other podcast now called Show Me The Podcast. You can go and check me out there with my friend Harry where we talk film and TV and I will chat to you again soon. Bye. The Pod Breed Network is strictly for the small podcasts that are up and coming in the vast world of podcasting. Pod Breed is made up of many diverse podcasts coming together to achieve the same goal of being the best damn podcast network on the planet. Find out more at podbreed.com.